In what I think will be one of the last podcasts that focuses on the Apple II for a while, I want to talk about a project I got involved in called the Was a Day Project and what it means both from a computer historical perspective and understanding our relationship to these insane machines. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Jeff Atwood, Daniel Boyd, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and other platforms who are helping me get out of debt. The Was A Day Project, basically, is a project by the Cracker 4AM to provide Was format files of canonical Apple II programs in a way that is the be-all, end-all of the digital originals. To do this, he's using the WAS format. The WAS format is associated with a product called the Applesauce, which was released this month and which is a uh, system of flux reading Apple II discs and then saving them in a format that retains all the attributes of the Apple II disc. This turns out to be many times more complicated than you would think, but it represents all of the copy protection, head moves, and tricks that people put in to prevent copying. To do this, it creates a 20 megabyte flux file called A2R, which contains all of the magnetic readings of the disk. These should be traded and kept as well, but the WAS format is really compact, a 140K disk with all of the copy protections pushed in may only become 200 to 300K in size. We're lucky enough to have a lot of Apple II original discs floating out there, and with the release of the first 100 Applesauce units, we're starting to see people read these discs and put them into this format. It's a bonanza of Apple II history. But is it enough? Is it enough to have a stack of these floppies and turn them into digital files and then let people boot them up? That's the question that we are now facing. It's the best kind of question. There are some areas of history and expertise where they don't even have the originals to work from. They've got to reconstruct, recreate, or in some cases make up out of whole cloth what things were before them. So I always recognize how privileged and happy the Apple II areas are. So on the Internet Archive, there is now a collection archive.org slash details slash wazaday, W-O-Z-A-D-A-Y, in which 4 a.m. once a day is putting up a WAS file along with all of the capture information that was generated at the time and screenshots to show you what you're looking at. That would be quite a fun thing. You go into the archive boot up one of these items, and in the browser, you're playing a vintage, accurate, original Apple II program. For example, just in the first few days, we're seeing Paperboy, Hard Hat Mac, which was one of the first games created by Electronic Arts, and Pool 1.5, which is a complicated, physics-laden pool simulator for the Apple II. And Left alone, 4 a.m. will come through. Every day we'll see a new program pop up and we'll play it for a couple seconds or glance over it and move on to the next day. 365 programs a year. And this is where I come in. I've been poking people to get involved to help us track down all of the contextual information for these programs. In the case of Hard Hat Mac, for example, there was a small controversy when the game came out. It, it, it shows a workplace and you are a construction worker. It's essentially Donkey Kong. You go around putting girders into place while you're being chased by various people, including an OSHA representative, a government uh, inspector who is making life hard for you. And there was a senator when Hard Hat Mac came 
came out, who wrote an angry letter about how this was terrible, that government agents were being portrayed as negative for trying to enforce uh, construction and safety standards. All of that happened uh, now nearly 30 years ago. And so uh, we've been gathering everything affiliated with Hard Hat Mac at the archive indirectly for years now. Aggressive amounts of gathering magazines and instruction manuals and catalogs means that there's printed material galore in the millions of items at the archive. There's podcasts discussing different games. There's screenshots that have been generated both automatically and, and by people. And if somebody takes the effort to go through the full text search at the archive, they can find them. So I've been trying to round up folks who are the researching and bookworm types to go through and find all of these little hints, which we will put into the entry for each Wazaday item. If you look at Hard Hat Mac now, it's got links galore. You can go to articles in Softline magazine and user newsletters and the original instruction card. You can find out everything from how to crack it, where the protection was. You can even find the articles about the senator's anger and what he wrote and what was reported about it that day. There's even a link to an Easter egg, which I didn't know about in Hard Hat Mac, where if you pressed control and the carrot key or pressed control and the pipe key, you would get messages from the two creators. It's all sitting in one canonical object. In the historical space, there's debates about how best to present history to people. You know, one way is to have somebody act like the thing they were in. This is where reenactors come from, or people who speak in the first person as if they were there to draw people in, to tell them a story. Uh, another way is to dump every little bit of information right there for a person. So somebody who was maybe assigned to write a report on Hard Hat Mac, well, we did all their work for them. They could go to this collection, go to this item, and they would be able to find, you know, something like seven or eight articles and visual information and the ability to play the game all from the comfort of their computer uh, in a browser. They could actually live Hard Hat Mac as an experience without ever going somewhere else. Uh, another way to do it is to both research and live what Hard Hat Mac is. In other words, get your hands on an Apple II, get your hands on Hard Hat Mac, do all of this research, and then play and write down what your experience of Hard Hat Mac is, and maybe even bring in folks from different backgrounds and different languages and different experiences and have them do it and then write down what their experience is. Now, at the end of the day, you'll have a particularly complicated piece of work for a simple video game. But on the other hand, there's something to be learned by seeing how things once were. And here's the thing. We don't know what we're going to get out of all of this. If we have a collection, an idealized collection of 300 Apple II programs that each played a part in Apple II history and which you could play and, and see and experience immediately and read about and read the context about. Is that going to forward humanity? Is it simply going to be an arcade? Is it going to be a place you walk in, lightly read the instructions, play a few games, get frustrated by some and walk away, get into some and play until you've quote unquote beaten it? Or is it going to be something like a learning institution where under the guise of games, you're actually learning about game design or graphic design or how to code things a certain way and what that reflects and the fact that you can get down into the code or or as lightly as play it and walk away means that somebody who's learning has all of the tools at their fingertips to become experts in one aspect of computer history. Oh man, we don't know. 
It's, it's that constant, unending mystery about what this is all for that can both drive people away from working on it or make people do, frankly, too much work to preserve one thing while getting rid of another. There's a lovely article that came out just a little while ago about conflicting narratives. And it's about Myst, the uh, puzzle-filled CD-ROM using uh, game that came out right at the beginning of the 1990s. And by one attribute is an unbelievably well-selling game that actually caused the adoption of the CD-ROM. But in another timeline was just this one side weird game that quickly fell out of favor and wasn't liked by anybody, only to be taken over by first person shooters and dominating video games to the modern day. This article shows how two completely different narratives can exist in the same space. And, and he writes about Steve Moretzky that to one narrative, of which I am certainly part of, Steve Moretzky is the Infocom god who created Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Planetfall, A Mind Forever Voyaging, and then, with the sad closing of Infocom, faded away to a bunch of smaller games. Yet, some of his games have gone on to actually be used by millions. They, they're Facebook games, or Logic games, or you name it. He, he's had a long and storied career, but to one narrative, it all ends in the 1980s. The only reason we can even debate these conflicting narratives is by saving everything. Uh, people will, of course, fall into one story or another based on ease, but research and verification allows us to maybe shift the needle a little bit. Without that absolutely critical pairing of getting the original materials and then providing access to them, we will let narratives dominate and confuse people when years down the line someone says, well, it wasn't that way, and there's nothing to back them up, even though they are likely completely correct. By the way, some of the games that are going to be in the Wazaday collection will be, by today's standards, minor, poorly ported versions of prominent arcade games uh, done for a relatively quick buck and selling and then disappearing without question. But buried in those programs are techniques and skills and insights into how to work with the Apple II that don't exist anywhere else. The copy protection schemes on some of these is even more complicated than the games themselves. Uh, the, the, the coding tricks to do things that require dedicated hardware in the arcades, uh, there's an entire college course right there. And as we go through it, we'll find things that we didn't know uh, are missing. When we put up Hard Hat Mac, I thought, well, we'll just link to the instruction manual. And the instruction manual wasn't on the archive. It was elsewhere. And we brought it in, but it hadn't ever been added. What a crazy oversight. Well, it's there now. And as we go on, all these other gaps will be addressed and will be filled. What's the audience for this? I, I've seen tweets from people recently where they put their kids in front of the simpler video games or educational games on the archive in the browser, and the kids are fascinated. I mean, the well-made games, the well-made educational titles, well, they're basically timeless. The fact that they have, quote-unquote, lo-fi graphics doesn't mean that the people who wrote them didn't get around those limitations and make even better software from it. Uh, if you play Number Munchers or Oregon Trail, it doesn't matter really honestly uh, what age you're in and what kind of computer software and graphics you're used to. The games are fun. They're made well. They teach you things, but they don't hit you over the head. Uh, you know, there are kids I see play these games and write reviews, and they are the happy-go-lucky sounds of children playing. Uh, it's really inspiring to see them take such joy from it. But the Oregon Trail game has so many different incarnations from the early 1970s up to the modern day when I bought an Oregon Trail handheld game at Target. 
just for giggles, and it's a completely uh, modified, weird game uh, working off of customized hardware. We'll be studying that in 30 years, trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, the Was A Day Collection, I hope, is a wedge, a wedge into a way of thinking about software where we are going to blast through what are thought to be dead and gone and finished sets of subjects and pry them open one more time to realize what's inside was actually timeless. This is Jason Scott talks his way out of it. Thanks to James Big Hoyanu, Sam Johnston, and Adam Green, along with the hundreds of other Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash textfiles who have been helping me uh, get out of debt. I've been very careful uh, these past few months not to overspend. Uh, the one place I don't skimp on is food and medicine. Uh, I make sure that I have all the medicines that I need, and I make sure that when I eat, I eat well. I avoid snack food. I avoid food that's full of artificial everything. I try to get whole foods uh, when I can. I'm a member of a crop share local to my home, and it's a farm that's a part of my life from all of my life. When I lived in this small community with my parents, there was a farm down the street called Fishgill Farms, and it's owned by the Morgenthau family, and it's been around for over a hundred years. And they've reinvented themselves, and I've learned so much from how they've reinvented themselves. And so I'm out there basically every week during the summer uh, picking food out of the ground and from trees. And that's been very very insightful for me. As a kid, I spent all of my time inside. I, I really loved computers and screens, and, and my ruined eyes show the, uh, the damage from that. But I wasn't a walker at my youth when you think I would be. I, I loved just watching television and picking up all sorts of pop culture references and playing with my computers and my video games. The fact that I intentionally go outside, walk among trees, see food that uh, I want to eat and then pick it, whether it's cherries or, or cucumbers or, or anything involving raspberries and berries, I, I love it. Uh, I, I love knowing that what I'm eating is stuff that was growing in the ground just a couple hours before. And here's something I, I think about when I talk about changing a lifestyle. To change a lifestyle, you had to have been living a lifestyle. And chances are you enjoyed that other lifestyle. I mean, people don't work all the time to live in a way they hate. They might hate some of the things they're doing. But if you enjoy snack food or if you enjoy doing something unhealthy, it's because you are enjoying yourself. You are enjoying life. It just happens to be it's having a health detriment to you. Once you add the health aspect to it, things change. But too many times we shame folks into thinking that they are, quote unquote, living wrong. You know, a, a, a person vapes or eats junk food or doesn't move or in other ways hurts themselves because that's their life and it doesn't do anybody any good to mistreat or insult them for making these choices. I don't think that's how change happens. At my local farm, they built a patio out the back of the main barn that looks over the orchards. And these are orchards that I ran around in as a kid in the uh, pick your own apple days. And I love sitting out there and thinking about how far I've come and that things are so much better, you know, than they used to be. I, I feel so much better. Uh, the walking that I do, the exercise that I, I, I take care of myself with, I see people and they are stunned by how different I look from my 30s, from my 20s. Uh, that's something that comes both from being able to focus on my own health and having freedom from something like IRS bills, medical bills, and other recurring costs. You're helping me to do that, and I really appreciate it so much.